And now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker this afternoon, Mr. Ben Vander. Ben is a senior manager with Bain and Company in, in San Francisco, California. He works primarily with the financial investors practice and has led over 100, oh my goodness, has led over 100 due diligence projects from series A financing to buyout and public equities. He also worked with Bain's technology and advanced analytics practices and leads the firm's recruiting at UVA. Ben grew up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania before attending UVA to study economics and statistics. He now lives with his wife, Kate, a physician and also a UVA alum and their daughter, Charlotte in Oakland, California, where they enjoy cycling in the beautiful weather and cooking with fresh California produce. We hope you will all enjoy this panel. Ben, the floor is yours. Thanks, Chris. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, and also echo, boy, it's amazing to have the help of the Econ Forum and amazing work. It's been awesome to, to collaborate with you guys. And I'm excited that we can do uh, this talk today. It's certainly nothing like this existed when I was in the Econ Department at UVA. So thank, thank you all. And thanks, uh, everybody, for, for joining. And um, let me give a, a little bit of an agenda for what we're going to talk through today. Uh, I'll go through a little bit more of my background and spend a little bit more time on uh, my time at Bain and sort of what that experience has been. Uh, I'm going to go in deep on two different cases uh, that I've done during my work at Bain uh, and in particular highlight some of the ways I used the skills that I learned uh, in the econ department at UVA uh, as part of that. Um, I'm going to give a very brief overview on joining Bain and Company. That This is not meant to be a uh, recruiting pitch. You'll hear plenty of those from us through the fall, but I know people will have questions, so I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the uh, Bain and broader consulting recruiting process. Uh, and then because the forum has decided to give me this soapbox, I have a few parting thoughts that I will just leave you with uh, in any case. So let me let me jump in. And then uh, as Chris mentioned, feel free to direct questions his way, drop some things in the chat. I will probably not be able to keep up with them flying by as we go, uh, but I'm excited to answer more of those towards the end. Uh, there will be some interactive portions of the presentation, especially through me talking about the, the cases. Um, so prepare in case I, I may cold call some of the people if there's no one is speaking up right away, coming off a of mute, and a couple of spots where I'll ask for people to like annotate with the, the Zoom features or something. Awesome. So a little bit more about me. Uh, Chris mentioned I grew up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm the oldest of five, although that's uh, no longer, as you can see, how I look, nor my younger siblings, uh, but grew up just outside of Philly. Uh, went to UVA and graduated in the class of 2014, uh, did economics, and then a uh, now illegal, I believe, uh, three plus one master's in statistics. Uh, you can see my now wife and I as children making a, a snowman on the lawn. Uh, I love Charlottesville. I'm excited to get back sort of as often as I can. I think now I realize with the pandemic, uh, this last year plus is the longest I have gone since I first got to UVA since being in Charlottesville, so I miss it quite a bit. Um, I joined Bain as an ACI or what we call an AC or Associate Consultant Intern uh, with the San Francisco office in 2013 between my third and fourth year at UVA. Uh, there's some photos of my intern class and then the full set of us coming back full time as ACs. And um, then after a couple of years with Bain in San Francisco, I did a three year transfer to our Boston office. Uh, moved there because Kate, uh, straight from UVA, went to, to med school there. And after a few years long distance, decided it was easier for me to transfer offices than for her to transfer med schools. Uh, so for anyone who's navigating the world of a potential career with a significant other in medicine. Uh, I, I both pity you and uh, understand the, the complexities that that brings. Uh, and then we got married, came back to the Bay last year, uh, I guess in 2019, when she matched for her medical residency uh, and welcomed our daughter. So Charlotte is uh, almost seven months old now. Uh, a few other things that I'm, I'm into, uh, as Chris mentioned, into cycling. Uh, I read a weekly newsletter. This is not a plug. Please don't all need, feel the need to go rush and sign up. Uh, but like everyone else in the world, I've decided this would be fun. Uh, I remain a big Virginia basketball fan, which is more of a novelty when I give this introductory talk to, I suppose, other, other groups of people. Uh, and then I have a personal passion for making and eating guacamole. 
and am a, a weirdly deep expert by no way through my work on hand dryers. There's other stuff I've become a weirdly deep expert on through my work at Bain. Hand dryers just happens to be a, a, a personal passion of mine. I was, it was very exciting. Maybe this is old news for many of you, but when they finally put in the Dyson in-tap dryers at the Charlottesville airport about four years ago, uh, that was a very exciting time for me. So in any case, into, into hand dryers. That's the fun one. Uh, I've, so as I mentioned, joined Bain in 2013. So I've now been there uh, just shy of seven years of full-time work and uh, haven't had other jobs along the way. And so as uh, you, some of you may know with the way consulting works, that's relatively unusual, although less unusual at Bain uh, than perhaps some other consultancies. And uh, you'll sort of see and hear why as we go. Um, but I haven't done the, the thing where some people will leave and come back for business school. I left briefly for externship, but by and large, this is the, the job that I've had. And mainly that's been because uh, I've loved it. And it's really different sort of at every step of the way. Um, and I've gotten to work on a really exciting range of projects uh, and with different clients. So during my intern summer, uh, Bain really wooed me in by letting me work on an awesome project in the video games and technology space. Uh, I grew up a gamer. I've like been to national Halo tournaments back when I was in high school and thought that was fun. And so it was a cool way to spend uh, a summer really digging into some of the business and deep tech aspects of it. Uh, that's back in 2013 when we were transitioning from the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 to then new consoles and there's a big processor architecture switch. And so it was really fun to, to dig into that. And um, when I came back full time as an AC, uh, one of the things that was exciting about being in our San Francisco office was getting to spend even more time with our technology practice. Again, just the general area of interest for me. And so I actually spent my first year or so at Bain, uh, which is longer than most people will spend on any given project. And um, thinking about the sort of next couple decades of the tech landscape and working through effectively a game theory exercise with our clients of, what do we think will happen in the market? What should we do? How will our competitors respond? And a bunch of really interesting evolving research to, to collaborate with them on their the strategic plan for that. And um, switch gears pretty actively after, after that and spent some time working with an action sports company. Uh, so think like surfing, skating, motocross, uh, figuring out their, uh, their plan. Um, got back into the video games world. This is one of the ones I'll spend more time talking about the details of uh, basically helping them figure out their, their retail strategy. Uh, and then my last project in San Francisco, uh, as I was getting promoted to be a senior associate, was working with a casino company, uh, which was super interesting, leveraging some of the statistics skills that I had learned at UVA, uh, working with them to identify their most uh, their best customers and successfully market to them, with the crucial caveat of how do they separate out uh, addicted or problem gamblers uh, who you'd very much not like to market to and instead send them addiction help pamphlets, uh, which is actually a really interesting data problem. Uh, it was a cool thing to collaborate with them on, as well as uh, a pretty fun dose of uh, business travel flying to Las Vegas for a couple nights every week for, for six months or so. And then I moved to our Boston office and joined for the first time our, uh, what we call our private equity ring fence, where we work with our investor clients, helping them think about different uh, businesses they're considering acquiring. Uh, moved over a little bit to work with our healthcare practice uh, with a company uh, that was trying to figure out the best way to bundle and price their products. Uh, they, they're a service provider to hospitals that helps them improve patient satisfaction and care outcomes. Uh, and so they were, were working with them on helping packaging and pricing strategy for their products. Uh, then moved back to our private equity ring fence where I spent more time and have spent time looking at everything from uh, farming and harvesting equipment to cleanup services from fires and floods, uh, jarred pasta sauces, specialty window coverings, blinds and shades, uh, and outsourced hotel laundry. Uh, getting to know intricacies of a bunch of different industries. I'm, I'm still remain sad that a hand dryers has never come up on that list, uh, but it's been really interesting to see. Um, and then for the better part of the last two years, I've been working uh, still with our financial investors practice, uh, but instead of focusing with our private equity and buyout clients, uh, more in the venture and hedge fund space. Uh, so looking at higher growth assets, uh, specifically technology, but not exclusively, uh, and getting to see what all that has been. Um, you know, I mentioned in addition to working on a range of different projects, it's also 
pretty awesome to see how the role changes along the way. Uh, so when I, I first joined Bain as, a, as an AC, a lot of the skills I was building are what I'll describe as the analyst toolkit of getting into different data, uh, working through particular problem solving questions with my teams and with my clients, uh, and getting good input from the experts around Bain and on my team. And, and as I've become more senior, more of my time is covering, uh, I'd say, sort of three new axes. Uh, one is working with my team to coach them up. So I now, at any given time, have between four and seven people uh, working on a team under me. And so it's an awesome experience to get to uh, grow and develop those people. And um, personally, one of the single most satisfying experiences I've had at Bain is because I also wear the recruiting hat. I've now, having been here long enough, had the pleasure of working on teams with many of the people that I've hired from UVA specifically and getting to see them grow and develop uh, from people I interviewed somewhere on grounds to like really kick ass uh, management consultants is a, a super rewarding experience for me. Uh, the second one is really digging into the collaborative aspects with our clients, uh, where instead of just solving their problems, I'm thinking with them about what does that mean, how to communicate it uh, crisply, and uh, get into a whole bunch of different, like how do we translate that into action, uh, which is a fun part of the job getting more senior. And then the last bit is really developing some expertise. Uh, so now instead of being a blank slate coming out of UVA where it was cool, I'm eager to solve problems, but don't actually know anything about them. Uh, there's a bunch of different topics like jarred pasta sauce where uh, I'm one of the experts at Bain on that topic, having spent time looking there and probably means I'm not in the top 10, but probably in the top few hundred people in the world who think about the, the business of jarred pasta sauce. Uh, so that's pretty rewarding to get to actually know some stuff. And, I guess last bit, I don't know exactly what's next. I'm expecting to be at Bain sort of as long as they'll they'll have me. Uh, but that's one of the other cool things about this business that you know, I see people from my class, both at UVA and others who were in my AC cohort uh, go on to a bunch of different cool things. And we can come back to that later if people are interested. Um, anyhow, but that's a little bit more about my background and how I got here. I thought it would be worthwhile to spend more of the time than digging into some of the specific content. Uh, and a couple of the examples of cases that I've worked on uh, in my time at Bain. One of the things that I get asked about uh, frequently is like, hey, will I, will I use what I learn in college uh, on the job? And how is it possible that Bain hires people who were poetry majors and hires econ majors and hires comp schoolers, and yet you're gonna tell me that we all use the things that we learned uh, in school? And, I, I wasn't a poetry major, so I can't speak to that, but I can tell you that uh, I took a lot of really fun econ classes when I was at UVA, and even in just the two examples uh, that I'm going to talk about here today, you can see spots where I uh, got use of basically everything that I learned from every single class that, that I counted towards uh, my major. And so you'll see highlights as we as we go through, but you can look out for the, the annotations of where those pop up. All right, so I mentioned uh, two different projects that, that we worked on. Uh, the first one was working with uh, video games companies. So just to, to step back, the situation is we were working with our client who was a uh, video game console maker and game publisher. Uh, so you think, you know, Sony, Microsoft, Nintendo, the people who make the, the big consoles. And um, they came to us uh, to Bain with a question. They basically said, hey, we know that in the world in general, uh, buyers and gamers are shifting from getting their games on a physical disc that they'd slot into that console uh, to downloading them through an online store directly through the internet to their console and playing it there. And they, you know, same thing happened in the music industry. We moved from CDs to iTunes to Spotify, happened to movies where we moved from DVDs to Netflix and streaming. And so their question is like, okay, we know that this is happening in our industry specifically uh, when that happens, what should we do with our retail channel? Uh, so if you're a game consoles company, you spend a lot of time partnering with GameStop, Best Buy, Target, Walmart, and some of the big retailers out there uh, to put your product in front of people and get that out into the world. And their question was, okay, what do we do about that? And so first, why do we even care about the retailers? That's not really their business or their problem uh, in a lot of ways. And this is the first time I'll sort of ask for uh, involvement from the audience. Uh, for reference, this is literally an, uh, a case that I use as part of my interviews. Uh, so I'm not gonna make this a official like practice case or anything like that. 
Uh, but this, the moment I'm pausing on now happens to be a question I will ask uh, when I give this uh, as an interview to folks. And I'll, I'll invite for a second if anyone wants to chime in off of mute why you might think that the participants would matter here. Otherwise, I will scroll the participant list and invite uh, a couple of folks to, to chime in. All right, Mitchell. Just since you are, you have your video on, I will uh, ask you first. What, what would if you're uh, the game console company? Why might you care uh, about your retail partners and the transition from physical to digital games? Um, just in moving forward, because obviously you said the companies acknowledged that they knew this was happening. So maybe um, just like an outreach, further outreach. Whether they, if they're, maybe they're wasting money putting all these. Um, like hard copies of games into the retail stores. Yeah, so that's so a big part of it. It's, uh, it's like a higher cost uh, to put discs through stores. And not only is it a higher cost, but they are giving away margin uh, to that to that buyer. So if you're GameStop, you don't want to just pass the game along. You charge some markup on the game that you sold. Hey, if you're buying it through the PlayStation store, you're buying it from Sony. Uh, and so they get to keep that additional margin for themselves. So that's definitely an upside. Uh, if you're the, the game console maker, lower cost and a higher margin that you get to keep for yourself. Awesome. How about I see Kelly uh, on this list. Are you you have free to unmute and throw something in? Um, yes, I think um, the retail part is also important because uh, to, to maintain a physical presence because a lot of uh, customers still buy from, um, still go to the supermarkets and uh, and the stores to purchase the video games or look at the video games, even if they download. And also it provides a customer experience for them probably experience the games before they might, they might choose to download from online stores. Yeah, awesome. That is exactly right. And there's actually a few things in there. Uh, you mentioned one, people like physically go to stores because that is a way they can get the games. There's sort of a, a distribution angle. Uh, second is they might go to the store to, as you say, like have the customer experience that feels like a positive way to research and learn about the games. Uh, and then third, the other thing you you sort of talked about is they might like impulse buy some of these. And so if you walk into a store, you're more likely to soak up the experience. You're not just sitting on your couch. You may or may not open up the app for the online store. It's like, oh, cool, I'm in the store. I'm walking by the store in the mall somewhere. And a particular piece of marketing or advertising or the game on a demo unit catches your eye. And so you'll uh, jump in to get it. Awesome. All right, that's a couple of the things. There's actually a whole bunch of different uh, pieces that when we were doing this work, we tried to decompose. Uh, we talked about a few of these. One is the, the distribution point. Uh, the second one is accepting cash. Uh, this is something that I hadn't appreciated until we really started thinking about it. But when you go to GameStop uh, and you're a 12 year old kid and someone has been handing you money and gifts in a card that grandma sent for a while and you've been saving up, you can hand those bills that grandma sent you in a card to, to the cash register. Can't really do that if you're on the online store. It's actually much harder to be able to buy the games that way. And two other aspects of demand generation. First is if you're, again, passing by, you might impulse buy a game. More importantly, though, you might impulse buy a console. So for anyone that isn't familiar with gaming, the way it works is you buy a box, the Xbox, the PlayStation, the Nintendo, or whatever it is. Then you hook that up. Once you have the box, you can go on the web store and download a game. But if you never thought to buy the box in the first place, uh, you have no way to buy the games down the road. It's a, a much more expensive version of razors and blades, uh, that sort of business model. But you need someone to buy the box first. Uh, and so the impulse buys on, on consoles is even more important if you're the, the console maker. Um, the other one is what we described in the work is share shift. So when you partner with your retail chains, you might say, hey, instead of throwing up more PlayStation signs and promoting that in the better shelves in your store, what if you put the, the Xbox ones on the, the eye level shelf? Uh, and so even if you're not just getting more people to buy games in general, you might steer them more towards your product uh, in a way that you can do sort of in-store marketing. 
Uh, the other one we talked about is taking a significant portion of the margin and the, the cost of the physical disks. But the other one that the, the retailers do is they create the existence of the used game market. Uh, well, I don't know if anyone has been to GameStop. One of the things they've done historically is you can trade in uh, a game you've already played and now you no longer have that disc and they could resell it to somebody else, uh, which actually has two, two sorts of value. First, um, if you are a shopper and you want to pay less for a game, the used game market creates basically price segmentation where people who are willing to pay a little bit less are still going to get into the game uh, because they, if they buy it used, it might be $20, $30 cheaper, something like that. And if you are buying new games, you implicitly, when you buy it, are still holding on to a put option to sell it back to the store later. And so it still reduces your effective price uh, in thinking about how much you're going to pay up front. And so again, if you're going to download the game instead, at least at the time, uh, there was no way to simulate either of those things. Uh, you could maybe think about in the online store a way to create price segmentation by doing sales over time. You could maybe allow a DRM or a digital rights management solution where you don't really sell it back, but you say, cool, I've only rented this game. I'm going to turn it off. I no longer have access, but they will pay you for some of that. And that creates, again, the same put option experience, but it's not the same as handing a physical disk back to the store. Um, you probably hear it in some of the language I was using this just here, but even thinking about all of these uh, felt like a significant use of a lot of the econ courses I, I took, both the microeconomics of it, the auction theory aspect, and the um, some of the antitrust parts, where in that last bit talking about the margin, uh, hey, what does it actually mean for a game to be 60 bucks? I know that's what consumers think it is, but how much of the price did the game console or the game maker set uh, versus what the stores are setting independently. There's a whole uh, vertical integration question to, to think about there that you learn about in Ken Elzinger's class. All right, um, so what do we do? So that's what the, the questions we were trying to figure out. And basically our clients were asking us, how can we estimate the magnitude of all of those different impacts and then translate that into something we can actually go make decisions based on? Um, one of the ways that I spent my time over the couple of months working on this project was consumer research. And in particular, we designed and fielded a high-end consumer survey of gamers and game purchasers, um, which was actually super complicated to sort of get right. So first you have to create the right panel of people you are going to survey uh, to get a representative sample of both the broader consumer population and specifically gamers. Uh, and one of the challenges with gamers is that many of them are younger kids and there's lots of rules and requirements about what types of market research you're allowed to do with teenagers and people under 13, uh, like what questions are you allowed to ask and also how credible are they as uh, uh, respondents to answering any of your questions, uh, which is super interesting. Um, the next bit, which was really fun, uh, was designing what we call a conjoint survey where, hey, we talked about all the different elements that impact um, the physical game uh, value proposition. And in a survey, it can be hard to disaggregate all of the different elements uh, of what those are. So what is just the price effect versus the put option on a used game effect versus online delivery versus some people just want a hard copy versus a, a digital version, payment options, cash versus credit card. Um, and one of the things that I had learned in a stat class, but I think which I had counted as credit in my econ major, so I'm, I'm counting it here anyway, um, was what we called our experimental design class, uh, where by designing a certain version of a sophisticated survey, you can create a model on the back end uh, to pull out all of the different impacts of, of those different levers. So if you've ever seen a survey, maybe you've taken one, or maybe you've talked about this in one of your classes, where instead of sit at directly asking, Hey, how much more would you be willing to pay for a game that is fifty dollars versus, or how much, how many fewer games? What would be the price elasticity of games that are fifty dollars versus sixty dollars? What you do is you create a series of questions where it says, here is a game that you would buy digitally, would be priced at fifty dollars, uh, would have the option to resell, versus a game that is sixty dollars that you'd buy physical. Anyway, and then what you do is you ask the survey question, which of those two options do you prefer? And then you rotate which options you show them and you ask them to directly compare like 10 times in a row. And what you can do is after that, basically do parameter estimates on all of those different factors that you listed to decide and disaggregate all the different impact. 
um, which is what you have at the bottom here. That's where I made use of some of the regression analysis skills uh, that I learned in the econ department. And the other part of our backend analysis, which I thought was really interesting, was we asked for location information in our, in our survey of like, what zip code are you from in our demographics info? And what we then did was match the respondents location information against a separate database we had gotten of where GameStop stores had recently closed, uh, where the, the thinking was cool, if uh, more people are buying or fewer people are buying physical discs, that's gonna make GameStop's business hard to maintain. If it goes long enough, GameStop's gonna go out of business what would happen to demand if that happens? And what we basically did is say, cool, I don't know about what happens if GameStop everywhere goes away, but I do know what happens if the closest one to you went away. And I can ask about your recent purchasing behavior and sort of estimate that, that potential impact too. And all of this was really fun to think through the design of collaborating with my team on setting up this work uh, and really interesting to then, to then piece apart later on. Uh, just by way of example, uh, this is one of the bits of data that we got back from that survey. So one of the questions we asked was, based on your last, the last video game you purchased, where did you buy it? Uh, was it at a, what we call a video game specialist store like a GameStop? Was it at a consumer electronics store like a Best Buy? Was it at a, a mass retailer like Walmart or some of these others? Where did you make it? And if that place didn't exist or you couldn't have bought from there, where would you have purchased it instead? Uh, and the bit that was most interesting from the responses to that question were very few people said they wouldn't have bought the game. Again, maybe not that surprising, but it was still useful to get an actual magnitude estimate of what that would be. Um, it was the highest for people who bought it either from the manufacturer's online store or from a secondhand store, which maybe is not surprising. Those are people looking for either a direct purchase or a used version that's a lot cheaper. Um, but otherwise we said actually, Retailers are highly substitutable with each other, uh, and you should not worry too, too much about individual closures from any given one. Um, the other thing we did was then, cool, let me roll that up. We had another bunch of analyses like that, uh, in addition to the ones I described before. And let's roll that up to, in aggregate, how much of the demand do we think that retailers are actually generating for your product? And so that if all the retailers went away, or if you were going to pull more of the dollars away from them, what is the pure demand and revenue impact that you would sort of expect? Uh, and we basically said our best estimate somewhere between four and 6%. Uh, not, not zero, but um, I think not nearly as much as our clients had initially thought about uh, as they were making some strategic decisions about what to do with their, their retail channel. Um, so that was sort of the, the main finding um, that the impact of a transition away from physical desks would have less of an impact than our clients uh, had initially feared. And we then did some initial work and additional work like financial modeling and playing this all forward to show that the magnitude of the upside. So Mitchell, what you had described before is keeping the margin and lowering the costs on a per game basis uh, massively outweighed that, which means that they could be confident in a strategy of aggressively driving the digital transition. And if anyone is a gamer, you've actually seen that play out industry-wide over the last five or six years since I did this work. Uh, where now even the uh, newer game consoles, the PlayStation 5 and the Xbox Series X, have disc-free versions where you can't even buy physical disc versions of it. Uh, and that's even a further continuation of this strategy that was sort of set in motion uh, five years or so ago. And I will say, based on all that, uh, I have nothing meaningful to contribute to the game stonk discussion, uh, which some of you have probably followed over the last month or month and a half. Uh, mainly, I would. the only thing I will say is I'd assert that all of the findings that I had here uh, in this work were about the company and operating performance of GameStop, the retail store, and it is remarkable for many number of other reasons how that is completely dis untethered uh, from the stock market and their, their performance there. And this was really fun. So I did this project in my, my second year at Bain, and I thought it was fascinating to learn more about an industry I'd always sort of casually followed as a gaming enthusiast. Uh, and cool to see, to dig into like the business of games uh, and a little bit entertainment broadly, talk about the analogies in music and movies uh, and how it all actually works. And this was my, personally, my first time applying survey research skills to the real world. I had done other research projects, obviously in my first year at Bain, uh, but learned a lot more about how the things I learned in school, though I, I talked about how I did make real use of those. 
uh, there's a lot that has to be uh, revised to sort of meet practical constraints of timing and cost and actually you know how do you, how careful can you be about a representative sample the statistician of me wants to be uh, completely perfect and buttoned up on that uh, but then the reality of getting that out into the real world you can uh, make use of your skills and be thoughtful about it but there's also only so far you can go and uh, correctly surveying exactly every uh, representative person perfectly at random um within my team structure i mentioned that sort of my role was evolving over time uh, for me as a second year ac this was my first time working directly with my team's manager uh, on previous cases i'd had like a senior associate uh, coaching me more uh, closely um, which was obviously amazing to have in my first year, uh, the really detailed mentorship of someone who'd been there before. Uh, but this was also a, a great way for me to learn and being more self-directed and basically doing all the work I just described uh, largely myself. Um, and the last bit, this was a really fun one to visit our clients' cool offices. Uh, game companies, as you might imagine, have some sort of cool setups because they're really design and sort of fun oriented in, in a lot of those. All right, so that's case number one. Uh, the second one was uh, Banknote Co. Uh, so the situation for this work, we were working with a private equity company that was thinking about buying uh, a banknote uh, company. Uh, yeah, so literally this company prints money. Uh, what does it mean for a company to be in the banknote business? Um, they, this is a company that prints money and provides both the materials and sometimes in, in some countries in the world, completely finished bills. Uh, so for instance, if you're the US government, uh, the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, you may or may not know this, uh, has their own printing presses that they actually use to make uh, every single denomination of bill that we use in the US. Um, but they have to buy the paper and the substrate from somewhere. They have to buy the inks from somewhere. They have to buy the holographic strips that they weave into the $100 denomination from somewhere. Uh, and so they work with uh, different outside vendors to get that done. Uh, there are some countries in the world that are either too small or too um, tech, uh, technologically not advanced or just don't have the preference for actually setting up a government entity to print their own money. And so what they will do is they will work with uh, various vendors to actually just buy pallets of bills uh, wholesale. In some ways, this is not really a money company. They're more a specialty manufacturer and the thing they happen to make is just bills. Uh, but it was really cool to, to think about a lot of that. Um, so the way that this works is uh, our clients are investors and they come to us with a bunch of questions that they want to know uh, as they are evaluating whether or not to make an investment uh, in the, in the, the banknote company. Um, roughly and most of the time, those fall into two main considerations. Uh, first is what is the trajectory of the broader market? So in this case, the market for banknote manufacturing. Uh, and second is what is the uh, competitive position they have? Are they likely to gain share or lose share over the time? Um, both of those subjects have a lot of super interesting sub questions that they lay out for us and we through research go try to figure out how to answer. And so on the market side, you know, what is gonna be the trajectory of cash and circulation, uh, not just in any one country, but sort of in every country around the world at the same time? Um, how will that vary by different denominations because uh, for example, a $100 bill is priced a lot higher than a $1 bill, not 100 times higher, but uh, quite differently as you think about which ones are going to be the most valuable. And the broader question is like, hey, isn't like cash going away? Shouldn't we be worried about uh, what some people in the industry will call demonetization and which you can see in some countries like the Nordics or Singapore? Uh, is it, isn't it weird to be buying a company that makes cash now that everyone around the world is paying with e-wallets or credit cards or, or something else? Um, as cash and circulation changes, how does that cascade to what we call new issuance? So it's not just about how many bills are floating around in the economy, but it's about how many are actually being manufactured and produced in any given year. Uh, so what are the trends and life cycles for bills? How will trends in cash handling? So if people, even if they have as much cash in their wallet, but they're not passing it around as much, so that's called lower velocity, uh, or if the materials change, the durability uh, properties of the bills, uh, if you've been to the UK, for instance, or Canada, where some bills are like, sort of feel plasticky, that's what's called a polymer uh, manufacturer instead of a paper or substrate manufacturer, how will that change how often new bills need to be printed? Um, we did deep dives on a couple of specific countries like the US and uh, at the time, uh, very critically, Venezuela, where hyperinflation there meant that there were 
printing a ton of new bills and not just printing new money into their economy, but actual bills to, to keep up. Um, and then we spent some time thinking about security features and anti-counterfeiting measures. How will that change pricing? And like, what happens in a recession? Uh, this was an interesting time to think, put my econ hat back on and think, okay, there's more money in a recession, but also how much of that is tethered to cash versus other things? Is there a, a demand for cash question and, and how that all works? So that was fascinating to think through. Um, and then the other bit was thinking through the competitive position. So uh, for each major customer, which in this case is effectively every single country in the world that it has to make a decision about this, uh, what share does this target uh, have today and what could they achieve? How are the, the decision makers uh, picking which vendors to work with and how do the vendors differentiate themselves? Um, how do they think about which technologies they should use versus which manufacturers and vendors specifically? Um, how often are the central banks RFPing or basically switching to new vendors? Uh, is that something they do like annually? Do they only wait every couple decades or longer? Um, what advantages do some of the incumbents have? How likely are people to switch away? Uh, and in particular, what sort of inflection could the banknote uh, code we were looking at in, expect uh, to see in their, their win rate in getting new customers? Um, the research tactic for this was get on the phone with as many of the decision makers uh, as we could possibly talk to around the world and, and interview them about how they worked with all the different vendors and what they were planning to do um, with their cash demand. Uh, and usually when we think about doing customer interviews, you just talk to, I don't know, consumers who are buying some product or if you're thinking about a retail bank, you go survey a bunch of people. I talked in the video game case, we surveyed gamers. Uh, not the same as trying to interview uh, the most senior central bankers at basically every country around the world, uh, so which was a sort of fascinating uh, research challenge. Um, cool. I'm going to flip back into making this a little bit interactive and talk about a couple of the questions that I'll throw to you. So just on the, the market trajectory point, uh, first question, as we're thinking about how you would uh, estimate the change in circulation over time and what drives it. Um, I'll ask people to use the, the Zoom annotate feature and put a, a star or whatever, a stamp on. Uh, is this more of a macroeconomics question or a microeconomics question? Uh, you all can highlight or, or stamp whichever of those two you think is uh, more relevant here. Or maybe annotate does, does or does not, does not work. There's at least a few. Cool. I'm seeing more energy for macro as an answer. Uh, I partially agree. I think it's pretty much both. So at a macro level, the question of circulation, the, the, macro, the thing that is definitely a macro question is what is the overall money supply in the economy? And um, one thing that you grapple with pretty quickly once you start looking at cash manufacturing is cash is a extremely small sliver of the overall money supply. And so if you're a central bank somewhere thinking about uh, macroeconomic policies that you want to implement. The way you actually do it most of the time is not uh, literally printing cash. It's much more about uh, issuing treasury bills or other ways that you will change the interest rate or other ways that you have to pull levers on the overall macro economy. Uh, but it is, it is part of it. Uh, the micro part that was really interesting to think through is like, what is the demand for cash specifically? Uh, so cash has demand from populations in particular like unbanked people, uh, that's a micro question. There's demand of what are the substitute options for cash? So are people more interested in uh, e-wallet or credit cards or something over time? And what is the cost or the price of using those? So as credit card fees go up or down, that probably does uh, change the demand for cash as a substitute for it. Um, and you can look at the dynamics of that in sort of every country around the world and think about uh, what's gonna happen to cash demand specifically, uh, which is super interesting. Uh, second one, uh, we can talk a little bit quickly, what's the relationship between circulation and, and new issuance? Um, I talked a little bit about it up front that was really interesting is 
it's not just about how much overall money there is floating around in the economy, but just as much about uh, what is going to be printed every year. And so there's the bills that have to be replaced or taken out because they get ripped or shredded or torn through the year. Uh, and then there's also what is the change in certain, like the actual delta of new circulation that you'll need to insert in a given year, uh, which is cool to sort of unpack. Um, just that by way of example analysis, uh, this is real data uh, as of 2018, I guess, on what the US Federal Reserve and the Bureau of Engraving and Printing were targeting for uh, cash in circulation, uh, which was super interesting to see as well. Um, the other thing we spent time doing, uh, like I said, was thinking about the competitive position. And in our course of our interviews with all the different uh, central bankers and figuring out what, what they cared about, there were a bunch of different things that we sort of asked them, excuse me, to rank and sort which of these matters most to you. Uh, and it was fascinating to uh, sort of understand what they found most interesting. And um, I'll give you a second to, to think about which of these you sort of expect would matter, uh, would matter the most. And um, if people want to do the annotate, you can tag or stamp whichever ones you think are floating to the top of that list, but I'll, I'll switch it over to reveal the answer uh, in a second. Cool. Um, this is really interesting to hear about. One of the things they always said that they cared the most about was security feature quality. So if you are a central banker, you are extremely risk averse. And the worst thing that happens to your job in particular is if there's a counterfeiting scandal or something that goes wrong. And it has relatively less to do with price, though price still matters because you're tied to only so much budget allocation in any given year. Uh, but you don't decide on that so much as a sort of a threshold criteria. And then obviously you care quite a bit about vendor reputation. The, the sort of business saying is nobody ever got fired for going with IBM. Uh, and if you go with one of the sort of big established players, uh, it mattered quite, quite a bit on this. And um, this was a cool exercise for me in thinking about both the auction theory dynamics, so because often they're required to put out to bid uh, certain things in RFPs. And if you're a government, you sort of have, there are rules that you have to take the lowest bid that fits some criteria. Uh, and also the public choice question of thinking about the individual actor as a central banker making decisions in accordance with their incentives, not just the ones that are incentives for um, the government more broadly and thinking through that. All right, very quickly, just by way of example, this is some of the analysis we did looking at all the different security features. Uh, I'll encourage you if you have any bills in your wallet or credit cards, actually, you can see some of the, the logos on here and the specific uh, things that people do uh, to make their bills harder and harder to counterfeit. Uh, the technology is actually pretty amazing to put manufacture these at scale uh, and create things that are uh, hard to easy for both consumers and then uh, basically like the uh, Secret Service and anti-counterfeiting teams to go dig into uh, and are some, in some cases highly secretive too, which is super interesting. All right, um, this was a fun one. We built a sort of detailed revenue projection for the company um, which enabled our clients to make a bid uh, with conviction. Um, they offered the highest price that they could realistically offer and lost. Um, uh, reasonable winner's curse uh, that you probably heard about in an auction or game theory class. Uh, they were outbid by another acquirer who in this case bid more partially because they had a different perspective on the business and partially because they had different capabilities to, to capture success. Um, I thought this was personally fun just as a different way to think about money and manufacturing, good topic for cocktail parties and case interviews with uh, students I was meeting later on. Uh, personally, this was my first project back as I uh, returned from externship. I think I mentioned I spent six months away from Bain uh, doing working on pricing and data science at Wayfair, the furniture e-commerce company, uh, which was cool to get back into the consulting groove uh, after some time away. And um, this was a cool one where I learned to have like nuanced conversations and in customer interviews. Uh, just as a note of empathy, this was the only time one of my interviewees has ever cried. It was when I was talking to uh, the central banker in Venezuela, uh, who was both feel for, fearful for his life and uh, the future of his country and economy, which makes sense, but was just really affecting to, to have that discussion. Um, and this was also some of my first time joining a leadership team uh, with, our, with our company. Uh, Chris, you're doing a good job keeping me honest. I know we're up close on, on I think, official time, so I will speed through uh, some of my recruiting notes here, and we'll, I want to make sure I have a little time for questions. I'm, I'm happy to go a little bit over on uh, our time here. Um, 
just to, to be uh, have the headline up front, uh, Bain is excited to hire a lot of you. Uh, so even just thinking about the people we hire from UVA, we hired about 30 people uh, from UVA last year. Uh, that is as big, that is bigger just from UVA than some of the AC hiring classes in some of our offices, uh, which is cool to see that the just from UVA we have pretty big scale. And um, the way that our recruiting process works, um, I'd say it's competitive and the bar is high, but it's also frankly really easy because it is straightforward. Uh, so this fall, we will show up to grounds either virtually or in person in Charlottesville, fingers crossed, and to do our roadshow with more presentations about Bain specifically. And we will be making people from our team, myself and others available to talk more about your individual questions. Um, and we will very loudly publicize when our application deadline and all of that information is coming up. Uh, I don't know the answers to that yet, uh, especially because the world feels very uncertain pre-fall, but uh, it'll probably be within the first several weeks back to back to grounds. Um, it's not a complicated application. You'll send us a, a resume and a cover letter, uh, and we will take applications specifically for third years for the internship program and fourth years for full-time roles or uh, people who are graduating in 2022 for full-time roles and 2023 for internship roles. Um, your application will get read. I sort of, that's the, the first headline. That's not going to be true for every company, but I'll emphasize it here. It will get read and it will be read by me and a team of other recent UVA alums among our ACs. Um, so it's not the type of thing where there's a filter for we only read people's resumes who are in the comp school. We only read people's resumes who's GPAs were above some number. Uh, we will read every single application. Uh, I will note there's a student that I will allow to remain nameless who uh, tried, I guess, decided to test me on this and wrote a joking cover letter last year uh, saying, you this is on page 700. I'm sure you won't read this. Uh, and I responded to him saying, yeah, thanks for the note. Yes, yes, we literally do read every single page of every application that people send us. And um, after that, we have two rounds of interviews, uh, an intro round, what we call sort of firm-wide with the UVA team, uh, and then a final round with the leadership at the office to which you're applying. Uh, those interviews will be case interviews, and I, I don't have time to go through a, a full explanation of what that means. Uh, but basically, the two examples I just talked about are literally interviews that I have given within the last couple of years at UVA. Uh, I suppose I'll have to come up with something different uh, now that I've shared those with you. Um, but where we talk through a business problem, we'll pose to you and ask you to walk us through your thinking uh, and the questions there. Um, in general, it does help you to do some practice beforehand to familiarize yourself with the format. And um, since it's very different than walking into some other interviews where it's cool to say, hey, tell me about a time you worked with a group on something. Um, but uh, practice is, is helpful. Um, I will say that one of the nice things about applying from the econ major instead of applying from the comm school uh, when I see a comm school applicant, I assume that they have done 40 or 50 uh, practice interviews because that's what they all do. Uh, when we see econ majors, we do not make the assumption that they have done a zillion practice rounds. Uh, so if you have done a bunch of your practice and gotten good at it, uh, you have a ingoing hypothesis that the bar is not lower, but we sort of have a different incoming expectation uh, on how that works. Um, just quickly, uh, some advice for recruiting and um, more broadly, not even just for us. Uh, get a sense for where your ROI is highest for your networking effort. I know you're going to hear from your career services department that like, hey, it's really important to network. And that is sometimes true. Um, I do mean what I just said, that even if you don't network with me or with others at Bain, I will still read your application. Uh, that is not true, I, I think, for every company out there where sometimes they're only going to read the resumes that they remember or have heard from someone about, or they just sort it automatically to, into a pile somewhere. Um, and so one of the things that's worth doing as you're thinking about applying to jobs is get a sense for how their process works. Uh, what is the structure? Who evaluates you? What are you going to be comped against? I just told you what that is for Bain. Uh, we will read every one. And so in some sense, your ROI on networking time with me and my team is probably lower than it is for many other companies. Not that we don't want to talk to you, but like we're still going to read your application even if you don't talk to us in advance. Uh, and that just won't be true for, for some other companies. Um, the only other thing to note is that for most consulting jobs, the summer program is meaningfully smaller than the, the full-time class. Uh, we hire, we try to create an actually positive summer experience and not hire a really big summer class and then just weed it down uh, to our full-time class, uh, which is different than some finance jobs. And so there's uh, unfortunately a little bit of game theory that some people might try to play for uh, which job to take an internship with or something like that, if that's two things you're considering. Um, but it's just something to be aware of. Uh, true for Bain and uh, true broadly, I think, for, for most consultancies. 
All right, I will do this one super fast uh, because these are my thoughts rather than answering your questions. Um, I just talked about why economics has been relevant for my job, uh, but I would say the most rewarding part about economics is that it's relevant to every part of my life uh, and that the best reason to study econ is not career preparation, but to enrich your life and the way you think about the world. Uh, I would strongly suggest that you go to office hours more, however much you're going to office hours more, now, do it more. Uh, it's amazing that you have the opportunity to learn both uh, the content and other things from your amazingly brilliant professors. Uh, as someone, in, as a consultant who explicitly trades my time for comp, uh, it's sort of unbelievable that you have free or rather free included with tuition access to the amazingly smart professors you work with. Uh, and even, I, I certainly didn't do it enough, but basically that's the answer for every student at UVA. Um, I miss it a lot. I hope you all have an amazing time uh, experiencing UVA primarily, uh, I, would, I would assert, as a consumption good. Uh, yes, there is something to be said for the investment good part of uh, getting career preparation. I just talked about how I use those skills on the job. Um, but you also don't need it. Uh, you'll be smart and great sort of wherever you end up career-wise. And the experience at UVA is, in my, from my standpoint, uh, also just fun and rewarding as it is. Um, in particular, that was one of the things that I found best about the early recruiting timeline for consulting. Uh, after I accepted this job, it gave me time to block out and worry about everything but my career. Uh, and the one that I'll specifically highlight, especially for any fourth years uh, on the call, is uh, one of the things that I very consciously thought about was figuring out who the other people at UVA were when I was leaving that I wanted to keep around forever. And it feels like an abundance, although maybe not right now, of time that you'll have with so many amazing people. Uh, and it will be never this easy to be around and keep up with so many uh, interesting folks. And so picking and investing in the relationships of the, the smaller subset uh, that you'll get to want to know is probably the single most important piece of advice I'd, I'd pass along. All right, uh, I know we're over. Uh, Chris, any burning questions from folks that I should try and throw in in the last little bit here? Yes, we have one really good question from Avni, and it's about the banknote case. Uh, so she kind of was wondering about how the pandemic has basically eliminated cash and also the coin shortage in America. So could you just talk a little bit about if you were to redo that case today, how drastically would the assumptions change and how much differently would your revenue projections have been? A lot. Yeah. Uh... Obviously, a pandemic changed, you know, everything about everything in the world, and certainly lots of business projections. Uh, I will not claim that I was clever enough to, in our risk factors section of that diligence work, to include what happens if there's a global pandemic that forces no one to exchange cash in person, and for the governments to inject massive amounts of money into the economy that inflates other asset prices, and now everyone wants to just spend it on Bitcoin instead. Um, it is. The right assertion, I don't have a fully fleshed out answer to exactly how that would impact it. Uh, it would be a fascinating follow up study uh, to this work to really like actually spend time digging into it because there is an analytical answer to that question. It's the kind of thing that since the pandemic, our clients have asked us a lot about. I don't know if it's been for banknotes specifically, but for how does the pandemic impact every part of every business everywhere? And obviously, is unsurprisingly, has been the top of mind agenda item for CEOs and the C-suite everywhere, which means it is on our radar for what we work on with them. Yeah. So we are running very close to out of time, but I have one last quick question from Caitlin on our steering committee. Uh, she says, for example, the GameStop case, uh, how long do you work on that type of case? Or maybe you can just say how long each of those uh, engagements was. Banknote Co. was three and a half weeks. Uh, Video Games Co. was three and a half months. Uh, so totally depends on the type of engagement we're having with our clients and the scope of questions we're, we're answering. Um, that sort of three and a half months, I would say, is approximately standard mm -hmm. for that type of strategy project. Uh, three and a half weeks is approximately standard for that type of financial and investment due diligence work. Um, but like I said, I've also worked on projects as long as more than a year and projects as short as four days. Uh, it sort of really depends on the, the nature of the work. One very, very last one coming in, which I like. Uh, how did you sort of pick your industries within once you got to Bain? Yeah, um, great question. So um, while you are more junior at Bain, one of the things that's amazing is that you don't have the final decision on exactly what projects you're going to work on. 
Um, that is different at different consultancies. And so it's, it's a good question and something as you guys are doing other recruiting, you should ask about at different firms. And um, some companies will use what they call free market staffing, where basically you are in the resource pool and you basically re-interview for your job with a bunch of the partners who are on projects you find interesting and try to get yourself onto their cases. And um, I personally think that it would be terrifying and not how we do it at Bain. The way it works instead is we have um, program managers in each office who are in charge of staffing. And what they do is they talk with you about what industries and topics you're interested in, what the type of work preferences you have are, whether you're open to traveling, whether whatever other constraints you have. Um, and then their entire job is to create the right overall work experience for you in terms of what projects they send your way, what mentors they will set you up with, uh, and how that will evolve over the course of your career. And so it doesn't mean that for any given project, you have exactly the, the topic you know next that you're going to work on. But over the course of your two or three year program as an AC, the commitment we sort of make is you will get a well-rounded experience. And what's great about having a program manager is they very often know you better than you know yourself. You're fresh out of school. How do you know what would be interesting to work on or what skills you should acquire? Um, they have worked with dozens or hundreds of other ACs with uh, in some ways similar, in some ways different profiles and set them up for success in uh, their careers and getting them where they want to go. And um, so you just very frankly talk about like, hey, I know I'm interested in X. I did this in school. I'd like to double down on that skill or here's a gap that I have that I'd like to fill. And um, that's how it works at Bain. Again, it is different at a lot of different firms. And so it's, it's a good question to ask about um, as you're looking at other consulting jobs down the line. All right, those were some good questions. We are officially, officially out of time. Thank you to Ben for this great industry talk and thank you all for coming. We hope you enjoyed the program.